Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful event. I've already learned a lot and look forward to uh, hearing the future talks. So, oops, I already hit it. So yeah, so a fairly long title, but we're trying to do a, a lot of things in this paper. I should just mention that this work is uh, joint with uh, Jia Heng Yu and, and Hao Jing uh, Zhu, uh, both from MIT, although Hao Jing is currently uh, at, uh, at the SEC. So we're, this is a paper about CBDC, of course, and so I, I thought it was just interesting to think about what we're trying to do now in, in the literature on, on studying CBDCs. And I, I always go back to this original quote from Ben Broadbent, the deputy governor of the uh, Bank of England in 2016, when he made this interesting quote that if all a CBDC did was to substitute for cash, if it bore no interest and came without any of the extra services we get with bank accounts, people would probably still want to keep most of their money in commercial banks. And so this is an interesting quote because it's, it's when CBDC concepts were first emerging, people were worried about the downsides, the risks. It makes a lot of sense. You know, the people that are, that are you know, working uh, in this space uh, see something new and they wonder what it's going to do to them. Um, but in some sense, the idea of this quote reflects the idea that the goal was to minimize the impact of CBDC, which is, which is kind of funny because if you want to do something, you want it to be effective. Um, uh, why, would you want it to, why would you want to minimize it? Uh, so this does seem a little bit surprising in retrospect. And, and now uh, people are looking more towards ways CBDC can be better than cash. So I think there's this interesting progression in, uh, in thought. And in particular, we can think about the uh, thing, thinking about the way CBDC can improve things. We can think about it both in terms of its store of value function uh, and its medium of exchange aspects. Um, and so if we look at what the current objectives seem to be, I've just put down Two, idea, two, two examples. So the Banking uh, for All Act of the U.S. is just one of many pieces of legislation. This particular one was by uh, Sherrod Brown and, and Maxine Waters, uh, but it's pretty prescriptive. In fact, it's remarkably prescriptive. <laughs> uh, central banks have been working for years already on this, but, but, but they were able to say exactly how a CBDC should work. Uh, so it says that the interest rate should equal IOER. Uh, it's, it says what uh, very prescriptive about, when the, uh, about what many of the services should be, uh, but clearly getting at this e idea that the CBDC should be, should be better than cash. And we can read the same things into the ECB's Digital Euro report, uh, talking about enhanced digital efficiency, usability, convenience, speed, all of these things, as well as the idea that it should help with monetary policy implementation. So quite an interesting uh, switch in position. Uh, in fact, I, I, I gave testimony to the uh, uh, Subcommittee on Monetary Policy and Trade several years ago on CBDC, and before I went in to give my testimony, one of the people said, whatever you do, don't say anything about interest. Okay, interest bearing off the table. Uh, so there's been quite a reversal. So what does this paper do? This paper considers two key design features that relate to the store of value and medium of exchange functions. So uh, the store of value uh, aspect is captured in the idea of thinking about the CBDC as being uh, interest bearing. Uh, and what we're going to show in our model is that the main implication this has is that it puts a lower bound on deposit rates. But most importantly, in the context of our models, we're going to have heterogeneous banks and there's going to be a wedge between the rates that banks charge. So this is going to be a binding lower bound on, on, on what's ultimately the larger banks and not on the smaller banks. And that's going to be very important for pretty much everything I say. And we're going to argue that this can help improve monetary policy transmission. Uh, the, the type of monetary policy transmission I'm talking about here uh, specifically is the, is the transmission of changes in IOER, or so the interest that the, the central bank pays on reserves uh, to deposit rates. Um, then the store of uh, medium of exchange function uh, we capture through thinking about payment convenience. And so this is the idea that a CBDC could offer uh, convenience and payments. And I'll be more specific about that. And what we're going to do is we're going to argue that this can have a, 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 the effect of leveling the playing field across banks. And so one of the impetuses for this work was when people would ask me, you know, you know what do central banks, uh, or what do commercial banks think about central banks? I always thought, well, it, it probably depends on which commercial bank you ask. So I was in Canada at the time, and I thought that the Royal Bank's opinion of CBDC is probably very different than Laurentian Bank's. Uh, and so one of the things that we try to capture in this model is that the Laurentian Bank might like the CBDC if it allows it to be more like the Royal Bank, uh, at least in this, in this aspect. 
So we're going to show that uh, what we're ultimately going to show is that CBDC convenience value is high enough. Uh, uh, it can also improve monetary policy transmission. Okay. Another thing that we try to do in this work is we want our paper to be relevant to a particular system, so to the U.S. economy. And so we want a model that's going to capture aspects of, of the U.S. economy. And the U.S. economy is currently one in which there are large amounts of excess reserves, in which banks are paid uh, interest on reserves, and banks have uh, monopoly power. So we want to capture those aspects. Uh, there's other work out there that, that, that does this, although surprisingly little work that really writes down models for the, what's called the long-run framework. Uh, Martin McAndrews and Ski is one example, and David uh, and Alfado's work is, is the other prime example. And so we build, uh, in terms of our underlying modeling, very much on these works. The big difference is, as I said, the idea that we have uh, heterogeneous banks. And uh, that's going to make a big difference in our model, because in our model, a loan is going to be made if, if the return exceeds the opportunity cost of reserves. So banks have plenty of reserves. They don't need to go attract new deposits to make loans. They can essentially make as many loans as they want. Um, and they determine this by an opportunity cost criteria. Uh, but that opportunity cost is going to differ across, across banks. And that's going to be fundamentally important. Okay, so a quick nod to the CBDC literature. I, I, I haven't updated this in a few months, so there's probably six or seven, six or seven more papers. But, you know, it's, again, I, I'm going back to the idea that, you know, these papers draw different conclusions, and the different conclusions generally depend on the level of competition, uh, whether or not there are liquidity properties of CBDC in the model. So, for example, in the Lagos Wright type work, there's these liquidity features. Certain monies can only be used for certain things. Uh, I don't have it on the slide, but there can be balance sheet costs or banking fees. Uh, these are in David's model, not in ours. But the conclusions you get depend on the model, of course. And so I think it's really important to tailor a model to the economy we're talking about, and this model is tailored to the, uh, uh, tailored to the U.S. economy. Okay. So let's get into the model a little bit. So our model has two banks, which is large enough for some things. Of course, there'd be different nuanced aspects to the results if we had many large banks and many small banks. But for now, a large bank and a small bank. Uh, the bank's assets are reserves. These are exogenous and large, so we don't model that part. Uh, and we can start off by thinking about the idea that they have reserves and deposits. And it's, it's just for the sake of this presentation, just imagine the bank starts off with, as, as a narrow bank with equal amounts of, de of deposits and reserves, but then they're going to start making loans. They're going to make loans through deposit, uh, deposit creation. Uh, so the central bank pays interest on reserves to the banks, uh, and the banks can independently set their, their deposit rates in order to attract depositors. Okay. Depositors, when they're thinking about which bank to go to, are going to care about their rates, but they're also going to care about payment convenience. And what do I mean by payment convenience? I mean that if you that when you have a deposit at a bank, you get payment services from those bank from that bank, and those bank those payment services can differ across banks. And uh, loosely speaking, we're going to assume that the payment services that big banks provide are better than the payment services that small banks provide. And this could be in the form of apps with with more features, more capabilities. Uh, could be something like more ATMs also. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a, of a, of a, of a banking service app that, that Hao Zhang produced. I'm not sure what it's from, actually. But it's a payment platform with many services. And the idea is that, well, let me go back to that for one second. The idea is that we're going to assume that the payment convenience at the small bank is zero. That's just, it says, the normalization. And that the, pot, the payment convenience at the large bank is, is not zero, but it differs across individuals. So individuals are going to get draws. Uh, mathematically from a distribution that says how much payment convenience they get from their deposit at the large bank. So we have heterogeneity in terms of how much payment convenience there is at the large bank and no, convenience, uh, uh, no payment convenience at the small bank. Uh, and then when we introduce a CBDC, we're going to assume that the CBDC generates this, this convenience for all. So the, the, the central bank in its infinite wisdom knows how to come up with convenient aspects that everybody likes. Okay, now the CBDC is going to be offered through the commercial bank. So what's going to actually happen in the model is the central bank uh, 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 digital currency, when it's offered through a bank, it means that you can, you can utilize all the services uh, of the central bank app through the, through the commercial bank. So, so that's kind of what I'm trying to depict here. But 
think of this mathematically as just the idea that the central bank convenience V is going to be a lower bound on the convenience at both banks. Sure. Separate. No, it's it's just adding to the payment convenience. No, so like in the large bank deposit has like delta plus V or like just No, it's it's it becomes a lower bound. Oh I see. Yeah, so you yeah. so you so you might think of the central bank uh uh yeah, just think of it as a, as a lower bound. Yeah. So if if so if if a large bank customer currently gets a low value of con convenience with the with the uh large bank it would still get V, it would get more convenience uh, uh, from the uh, large bank once the large bank has the CBDC app as part of its offering. And one way you can think that this makes sense is that it, just think of it as being seamless, uh, costless to move money across accounts within the bank. Okay, so you can utilize whichever payment service you want uh, if you're at the large bank or if, if you're at the small bank. Yeah, so sure. Bank, right? Yes. So, 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 but now you have a large bank app. So is is V now the convenience for that associated with a large bank if it uses CBDC? Yeah. Let or me. Is, so, or is it or is V a convenience for the central bank? It's app? it's it's the convenience for using the central bank app, but the central bank digital currency is going to be offered through the banks. So if you're at the large bank, you can make a payment either through the can either through the central bank app or the large bank app. If you're at the small bank, you can make it either through the small bank app or the central bank app. Uh, so therefore, the convenience level you're going to get is going to be bounded from below by the convenience of the central bank. But currency. the convenience at the large bank remains unchanged or has become better now that there's also a central bank option in there? That, that, that was what... Yeah, I, it, I, it, 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 it will be changed for the people who had low convenience, who get low draws for convenience at the large bank, because the V value is common to everyone. So uh, yeah, I'll actually show it mathematically in just a second. But thanks for those questions. Okay. What this is going to mean in terms of the model, you can immediately understand, uh, is that the CBDC interest rate, therefore, is going to become a lower bound on the on the deposit interest rate at each bank. So if you say lower bound, it's a lower interest rate. No, a lower bound. So they so the so the no one would hold given, given that you get the, the given that you can have the convenience value of the central bank digital currency. No one is going to hold the central bank uh, digital currency at at a uh, uh, at a lower interest rate. Oh, sorry, no one is going to hold the commercial bank deposit at a lower interest rate than the central bank digital currency, uh, because they can offer the same convenience. Well, the commercial bank. Yeah. Well, no, I would argue. Well, okay. So, for the purposes of the talk, the, the I would argue that in places like Canada, where you have deposit insurance and bail-in policy, that the bank, that deposits are essentially riskless. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, timeline of the model. So, we have a unit mass of agents, and these agents are going to play three roles. Uh, banks are going to set these deposit rates, uh, RL and RS, and then the central bank sends IOERF. Uh, CBD, uh, the central bank sets the CBDC interest rate S and the convenience value V. So it assigns the CBDC, um, and each agent already has an account at the commercial within a commercial bank. That's at time zero. Uh, then at time one, each agent is going to be endowed with a with a project. So they're also going to be play the role of entrepreneurs, and they're going to go to their bank uh, to borrow one dollar, uh, and the bank will decide whether or not to fund their projects. Now, the, the projects have different quality. They all pay off A, but they have different success probabilities Q. And so those are, those are draws. So some people's projects are better than others in the sense that they're more likely to succeed. Uh, and so they go to their bank, and their bank is going to make a decision. It's ultimately going to have a cutoff criteria for Q. It's going to decide whether or not it wants to give a loan uh, to that customer. Uh, once the customer gets a loan, it's going to uh, spend the money. It's going to take on the project. Uh, so it's going to uh, spend the money to, uh, to a worker. It's going to pay a worker to, to carry out the project. And then that worker has to decide where to deposit that money. And that, that uh, worker is going to decide where to deposit the money based on the interest rates that are offered in the convenience value. OK, and then at the end, payoffs are revealed. So. Uh, an important part of the story is that we build in deposit creation. So the idea is that initially, as I said, we can think of the banks just starting off as being essentially a narrow bank. And let's just think about 
the idea of a single dollar loan being generated. So what does a bank do when it generates a loan? It creates a new deposit uh, and it uh, has an offsetting uh, asset on its balance sheet, which is, which is the loan. And then, as I said, eventually the worker, the, the loan, I didn't take the loan for no reason. I take the loan to undertake a project. So eventually I've got to spend that dollar. I'm going to pay a worker. Um, but that's when it gets kind of interesting. So in our model, it's a, you know, the amount of reserves in the system, the banking system is a closed system. So that deposit has to go somewhere. Uh, and as far as I know, all of the literature doesn't necessarily address this, but there's a reasonable chance that that dollar is going to come back to the same bank, that the worker that is paid with the, by the entrepreneur is going to bank at the same bank. So when you generate that loan, you don't necessarily lose the deposit in the associated reserves. There's going to be some chance that you're going to keep the deposit. So alpha S, which is going to be determined endogenously, is going to be the likelihood that the dollar leaves the bank. If we're talking about, this is just a balance sheet for the large bank. So there's some, you can think of it as alpha S as being the share or the probability that that loan dollar uh, goes to the small bank. So reserves are only going to de decline by XL minus alpha S. And so this is going to be important because this is going to be, if, if we thought from the small bank's perspective, alpha L is, is bigger than alpha S. This means that the, ultimately the opportunity cost of making a loan in terms of lost reserves is going to be different across, across the banks. So I think this is a crucial feature uh, that doesn't exist in the uh, 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 existing literature. And so now I can go through and I can write down some of the math that defines the uh, can, equations we need to compute the equilibrium. I can do this fairly quickly. I'm going to demonstrate most of the results of the model using some pictures. Uh, but essentially, we can think about what the, what the profit is, uh, what the uh, marginal profit is of lending. And so if the bank decides to uh, uh, generate a loan, uh, it's going to have a, a change in its interest on reserves. All right, so its interest reserves aren't going to fall by the full amount of the loan because it's going to retain some. Again, this is from the perspective of the large bank. It's going to make some profit on the loan. RI is the interest rate. So this is just the profit on the loan. This is the probability that they get paid. They get paid one, one plus RI minus the, the dollar that they use for the loan. And then there's this cost of deposits, which is that they uh, have, to, have to remunerate deposits at, the, at their interest rate, RL. And if the large bank doesn't make a loan, it just stays with the status quo. So it's just earning IOER, F is, F, F is interest on reserves, uh, minus its deposit rate on its existing reserves. So if we look at the dif difference between this, we can see the marginal profit of making a loan. Okay? So I won't, I won't, uh, I won't uh, dwell on that. And, oops. Yeah, this is dying. Uh, yeah, and then before going further, I didn't get any question about this idea about retained deposits, but this, this is something I do think should be modeled. So what, what we're showing here is we're just showing large bank concentration. So we're showing the share of the deposit market by U.S. banks, by the largest U.S. banks. And so here you've got Bank of America having as high as 12% of deposits in the United States. So that's not a negligible likelihood that the loan uh, that they make is going to end up being retained. The reserves associated with that loan are going to end up being retained. Okay. Okay. So now to compute the equilibrium, we of course do it by backward inducting. We start by looking at, yep, what happens in the deposit market. So I'm just trying to think through what happens is alpha L is one. So in the case there's full retention of the deposit, I guess the F drops out on both sides, right? And then you would just make the loan, I mean, the, 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 the CB funding rate yeah, and the it, reserve it, rate no longer that's right. matters, yeah. right? You're just looking at the difference between the interest on the loan and the interest on the deposit. Yeah, but, okay. but, but, but what's crucial no, for no, us... I'm just, just yeah. trying to understand the equation. That's right. But what's crucial for us is that, the, is that, is that it's not one. Uh, nor is it zero. Uh, and so the, we're going to end up with a differential uh, opportunity cost. Which, which, so the opportunity cost is linked between F and the RL. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see why that's important. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Sure. A quick question about the alpha uh, as well. 
uh, you seem to assume that um, the loans stay within the national economy. And uh, so how do you account for internationalization of the economy and the fact that the loans can be made to buy some goods and, and, and services from abroad and they are not going to be injected back to Yeah, deposits. let me just say for now, now that I'm not. And yeah, okay. I'm going to just skip. Okay. I've only got less than 10 minutes. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, though. Okay. So uh, quickly, just assessing the equilibrium. So uh, the first thing to do is determine what the deposit shares are going to be. So the deposit shares are going to be determined by, by the, the interest rates that are set. Or set. Remember, consumers are deciding between, so these are the people that have got paid a dollar in the U.S. economy, in this case, uh, and they're going to decide where to deposit. And what are they going to look at? They're going to have their convenience value draw, which is, comes from the distribution G, uh, and they're going to decide where to deposit based on the spread between the interest rates, uh, whether or not that covers, how much that covers their convenience value. Okay, so uh, so if the uh, if they if they're better off going to the small bank uh, um, because the spread is larger than the convenience, they'll do so. Otherwise, they'll go to the large bank. And this just gives you the measure the measure of consumers that prefer the small bank versus the measure of consumers that prefer the large bank. Okay. So then uh, we can look at the at the loan market, and so this is back from our our uh, our condition that gave us the marginal profit on the loan. So banks are going to make loans if they're if they're profitable. If the if the net, if the present net present value of of, of of making the loan exceeds the the opportunity cost, so we get these thresholds, uh, and you can see the key is going to be that the threshold is going to depend on uh, alpha L. Okay, so that's where this is gonna this is gonna matter. They're gonna have different thresholds depending on whether or not they're large or small, um, because it's it's uh, less costly to make a loan if you're likely to retain the reserves and therefore earn IRR on those reserve on those reserves. Okay, I just want to get to the some of the results, and so then of course we can write down the ultimate profit equation, uh, uh, and the profit equation is going to reflect both the profit on loans and and the uh, profit from reserves. And notice that in, in factoring in this, you're going to factor in not only the, this is just integrating over all the, all your cost. So ML is the share of customers you have. Uh, then you're integrating over, over the range of customers you have for which their probabilities of, uh, of, of success are greater than your threshold. So then you're just integrating over all those marginal profit conditions. Uh, and then you're going to have just the, prob the profit you get from reserves. And this takes into account from the fact that some of the reserves you get come from, just like your reserves go to the other banks, other banks' reserves come to you. I won't dwell on that. Okay. And so we're going to get two equilibria. We're going to get uh, unconstrained equilibria, and we're going to get a constrained equilibria. So essentially what the, the, what the results are qualitatively is that uh, 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 in a constrained equilibria, it means that, so generally speaking, the large bank is going to be able to, because it offers more convenience, it's going to be able to set a lower interest rate, deposit interest rate, than the small bank. Sometimes the ideal interest rate that it would like to set would be negative, but it can't do that in the model. So then it's at a, it's at a floor. All right, so in the constrained equilibria, the large bank sets an interest rate of zero, and the small bank sets a positive interest rate. Uh, in other cases, both rates will be positive, but the interest rate of the small bank will still always be larger than the interest rate of the large bank. Okay. And I should also note here that uh, when we have a CBDC, it's not going to disintermediate banks uh, because the banks are, have, are profitable, they have monopoly power, and what they're going to simply do is they're going to pay higher rates, lower their profits in order to re retain their deposits, similar to what's in David Andalfato's paper. Okay. Uh, I wanted to make a quick uh, comment. I've only got about five minutes left. So I want to make a quick comment about uh, the impact of uh, uh, why this model is useful. And so I'll just go straight to the pictures. So what's going to be driving the results in this paper? Or what does drive the results in this paper? We have the difference in banks. And we have the case, we have the fact that for uh, in some cases, we have the constrained equilibria. When do we have the constrained equilibria? By the way, we have the constrained equilibria when, when F is low, when IOER is low. That puts us in low interest rate regimes where the large bank is likely to be constrained. Okay? Uh, so what does that mean? It means that if IOER, IOER is to rise in that area, it has no impact on the rates at the large bank. 
So the, so the deposit rates of the large bank are completely non-responsive to interest rate rises uh, when IOER is low. If IOER gets high enough that neither bank is constrained, then both banks raise their interest rates, their deposit rates, one for one when IOER rises. So what do we expect to see in the data? We expect to see that when IOER is large, that we expect to see interest rates, deposit rates move more or less one for one with interest rates or with, uh, with IOER, okay? Now, in reality, there's, a, there's some, you know, Jerome Powell mentioned there's a lag, so there's some stickiness, but that's more or less what we see. Whereas when we move to low IOER regimes, which essentially put us into the constrained equilibria, now when IOER goes up, the, the large banks don't move, and they, of course, have the largest share of the deposit market. So the weighted deposits don't hardly move at all. So this, in, this model alone, this aspect of the model, goes a long way to explaining why we saw so little increase in deposit market rates as the Fed, in, in liftoff, uh, raised IOER time after time after time after time after time. Okay? All right, so I think a crucial fact. And that's also, I'm going to be running out of time, so that's also crucial to understanding what the impact of the CBDC is. Okay? I'll explain. So, because of this fact, uh, IOER pass-through tends to be very low when we're in low uh, interest rate regimes. Okay, again, why? Because the large bank is constrained, it doesn't change its deposit rates when IOER rises. So pass-through is very weak. Okay, whereas if we get into high interest rate regimes, pass-through can be greater. So what do we do, do in low interest rate regimes? Well, that's the role for the CBDC. Because the CBDC can impact the deposit rates in some sense directly. Right? So this is just showing you a situation where the, uh, where the CBDC uh, interest rate S, where we increase the CBDC interest rate S, what does that do? Well, the central bank interest rate rises one for one because it's a, it's the, it becomes the new floor. Instead of the floor being zero, the floor becomes S. Now, that increases pass-through because we get higher deposit rates for, as, for higher, you know, uh, closer to IOER. But an interesting fact is that since the rate of the, of, the, of the large bank moves one for one because it's just a floor, the equilibrium response of the small bank is less. It increases, but more slowly, we get divergence in market shares, okay? So we get a, a wider dispersion uh, in terms of the market shares in the economy, which can make, you can make some arguments why that's not a good thing, okay? I'll skip what's going on in the loan market, um, and I'll move to convenience. I'll skip the summary of the results, but they're in the paper, of course. Uh, and then if we think about convenience, well, convenience has a, has a different effect because what increasing convenience does is that levels the player in playing field. It makes the banks more similar. It means that the small bank can charge a lower rate uh, and still compete with the larger bank. Okay, and the large bank has to raise its rate. So what we end up by increasing the convenience value uh, is we get this uh, uh, essentially convergence of rates and the banks become the banks become more equal this is this is now dead Yeah, so, so something's happened with the slide and the total, I, I, I'll be done in one minute. So something, something's happened with the slide and so the total isn't showing. Um, uh, but essentially, wh one of the point, the final point I wanted to make is that, is that what's, what's interesting with convenience is that we have these, uh, well, combined effects. Uh, At what? Oh, well, oh yeah. Well, I'm trying to get onto the right slide. Um, we'll go back a couple, I guess. I, felt, uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, have you studied uh, the, the case where the CBDC interest rate is negative? Say that again. Uh, have you uh, watched the, the, the case where a CBD interest rate is a negative? Negative. Well, if I consider the case where the CBDC interest rate is negative, 
Yeah, no, I mean, we're not, we're not, uh, yeah, let me just say no. Okay, thanks. <laughs> There's lots of reasons why that's not at least politically viable and why people aren't really considering that. And, and you know, it's just like saying that, you know, it takes away this lower, zero lower bound problem. And I am arguing that a lot of the effects that we're trying to get at are driven by this zero, zero lower bound. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an important idea. But, um, but anyway, we're, we're, we're assuming that the, 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 a zero lower bound would be enforced. Okay, let me, let me just wrap up. Um, I'm on that slide. So essentially what we're trying to show in this paper is that either interest rate or convenience value can be used to increase uh, pass-through. What I wasn't able to show at the end is that the convenience value ends up, ends up helping pass-through, but only if the convenience value is large enough. Okay. Um, so increasing CBDC interest rate raises deposit rates, but it causes deposit shares to diverge. Increasing CBD uh, convenience value not only raises deposit rates, but it also causes deposit shares in the market to converge. Okay, which could be arguably favorable, for example, for financial stability concerns, uh, but this is only true if convenience is high. So I'll just conclude on the idea that it's, that it's important to pay uh, attention to all design aspects uh, of CBDC and how they interact, but most importantly, it's uh, important to account for the heterogeneity, the differences across banks. All right, thank you. There, there's something that's somehow fundamentally puzzles me about the paper, but I may have missed the crucial aspect here, so if you sure. could just illuminate this. The fear about the disintermediation is that people get out of bank deposits and get into CBDC instead. So if that was happening on a grand scale, then banks, you know, they may have all the monopoly power they want, but they wouldn't have any deposits anymore, and they wouldn't make any profits, and they would be very unhappy about this. Now, even if this happens to a degree, right, then, then the deposit base shrinks there, you know, and, and uh, you know, banks are very fearful of this. It seems to me that new model central bank digital currency is not treated as an alternative by customers, but more as an add-on on how to make payments, that is the total deposit base for banks doesn't change, it's just changing the shift between how much the small banks and how much the large banks get and what they and what the depositors earn on the return, returns and you know that's fine to point out but it's not like things are flowing out of the commercial banking system into the CBDC world and and, di and reducing you know the yeah. deposits as a funding base is that is that a fair statement or well yeah but let me let me just say if I rephrase it maybe I'll be saying the same thing it's yes in 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 our model in David's model and in in Jonathan's model um, if 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 the banks have market power then they don't get disintermediated they just have to give up some profits so they, they, they raise deposit rates. When the, when the CBDC comes along with a positive interest rate and or convenience that makes it attractive to, uh, to consumers. Is it because the CBDC comes and then when they deposit the CBDC? No, they don't. They, what they, does deposit, what the, does the CBDC, CBDC do essentially here? acts as so a... So CBDC is not really circulating then? No, I mean, not, in CBDC, large, not, not in large volumes. CBDC accounts would all be zero and deposit accounts would be unchanged. It's, it's a threat point. It's a, it's a threat point, it's but a threat nobody point. holds CBDC yeah. in this model. Yeah, so... so and, and this isn't uncommon. The, 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 the overnight reverse repo facility at times serves exactly the same function. So it's a facility, it's there. It's at, sometimes there's large take up for a variety of reasons, but much of the time it just acts as a threat point in the market that, that influences mm -hmm. a federal funds trades. No, no, I mean, that may be fine. It's yeah. just, it just probably for the purpose of thinking about the disintermediation, it's probably important to spell out that we are only using this as a threat point and don't really mean anybody to actually hold CBDC and CBDC accounts will be... Yeah, but I, would, I, I, I guess mean, I would just say it a little bit... Fine, but I, I guess I would state that same thing a little bit differently, though, Harold. I would say that if, if we consider models where the banks have sufficient market power and therefore profits in the deposit market, then there won't be disintermediation because they're able to compete for deposits. It's not a property of the model. I would say it's a property of reality. I think that's the best prediction of what would happen in the United States with an interest-bearing CBDC. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. To have a bank run, you need the destination to run to. By having a central bank uh, digital currency, you have a destination. How would that feature in your model? So that's not a steady state that doesn't hold over time, but there's a day when depositors panic and now they don't have to run except to another, another bank. 
with this feature, they will run into a, a, a CBDC. Well, I mean, people can run to lots of places. So different, we've had different and types we've of seen, runs. We've seen that. We've seen that. I just want to be cleaner here, and I'm suggesting that CBDC seems to be really safe, more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know how, what your how your question relates to what I what I'm what I'm saying. I mean, the, well, this I, isn't I a model of I want to focus on the period when when depositors panic, not a steady state, not when they compare rates, but say, look, even for twenty percent, I'm not going to JP Morgan; I'm going to the central bank. I'll, I'll keep it there for a week or two weeks until things calm down. Yeah. So so. Yeah. Okay. We we don't have that in the model. There's no there's no there's yeah, no uncertainty about, about the safety of bank deposits in the model. Uh, but but if, if you're trying to say that there are certainly reasons outside, e even though in our model, in our environment, the central bank digital currency would not be held, it really acts as a threat point. It's, it's also reasonable to believe that in the real world, there'd be lots of things outside the model that would cause some levels of CBDC to be, to be held. One could be people's belief that commercial bank deposits aren't safe, and so they want to have some fraction of their wealth in CBDCs. There's lots of things, but these, these are outside the model. The main point is what differs from a model like this and some of the other models in the literature uh, is, that, is that because of the fact that the banks have monopoly power and can therefore give up profits to compete for deposits, we don't get the type of uh, sort of wide-scale disintermediation that other models predict. Well, I, I was just going to come to Rod's defense in, in that question. Uh, yeah, the CBDC provides a re run vehicle, but I mean, there's, there's, Rod's paper wasn't on the question, but if he wanted to do it, you could make the CBDC rate state contingent, drop it deeply negative to discourage the run from happening, for example. And if the lower bound is a constraint, well, I mean, that's cash. We already have that today, so. Yeah. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. This is a statement about a policy on the CBDC rate and how it could potentially be designed to accommodate a run. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a secondary thing. I mean, the, ideally, there'd be the discount window to... Yes, Rod, just in terms of, um, you showed the shares of the banks, uh, like Bank of America, but I guess what you're saying applies also to smaller banks, uh, regional banks where the firms that they lend to and the workers and the depositors are all oh, the sure. same. I just want yeah, to point it, that it out. It applies to all banks, just to yeah. a greater or lesser degree. You might think it's, one of the thoughts that people might have had is that this likelihood of, in, in, in the U.S. system with thousands of banks, that the likelihood of deposit retention is so small that one shouldn't take account of it. So I just showed that for the largest banks, these, these percentages are quite significant, are quite large. Yeah. Is there any other question? No. Okay. So thanks for the presentation.